<clears throat> okay, well, I've already read for you the text, and I've already told you the reason why we're looking at that. So uh, let me just begin with a little bit of introduction to Hebrews 11 uh, as a reminder to us of the importance of faith, and I think we understand that. We're saved by faith. We need to trust in Jesus to be justified. But we also need to live by faith. That is, we need to trust God and His promises in every area. And they need to make a difference in the way we live. So the author to the Hebrews is, is pointing that out to his audience, of course, to keep them from abandoning Christianity, which is a religion of faith. I mean, it's, 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 it's a relationship by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ without all the, the, the shadows and the types of the Old Covenant. And I think some of the, the Jews and the, uh, the New Covenant were having a difficult time hanging on to those things, uh, the spiritual things, particularly as the uh, persecution was being ramped up by the, uh, the Romans. So anyway, he's telling them to hold on, and he's pointing to the Old Testament saints and how they did the same, how they endured suffering by looking forward to the, what God had promised. So he, tells, he begins by telling us what faith is and what it does. He says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Remember, what, what's hoped for is something you don't yet have. Faith is something that takes hold of God's promises. It trusts Him to the point that even though we haven't yet seen the fulfillment, even though we don't see it even beginning to be fulfilled, we know that we already have what it is that He has promised. We're convinced that He will give it to us. And that's the reason why the saints did what they did. Uh, why Abel obeyed God and why he gave him a blood sacrifice because he was looking to the promised seed who was going to be again wounded as he crushed the head of the serpent while Cain was not. Faith is why Enoch walked with God and pleased him so much that God took him out of the world and took him to heaven. So Enoch only lived briefly in this world, only in the 300s, whereas uh, others were living into the 900s. You know, should he uh, feel bad about that? No, because he got something that was much better. Faith is why Noah built the ark. Uh, he believed God's warning that he was going to send a flood into the world that would cover the mountains. And he acted on it when there was really nothing but the Word of God to indicate that it was going to take place. Before he saw it, he believed Abraham left his home country and went to a place he had never seen because he believed God's promise that he had given that land to him and to his descendants. Of course, Sarah conceived when she was in her old age. I think she was around 90 because she believed that God was faithful. Abraham was willing to offer his son, the son of promise, because he knew that God would raise him from the dead. You, you understand how that works, of course, because he said through Isaac, your, your seed shall be called. Isaac had not yet married, had not yet had any children. God says, I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham was willing to do that because he knew God would still fulfill that promise to raise his seed, continue his seed through Isaac. He knew God was faithful. And for our purposes this morning, faith is why Moses, when he became a man, didn't embrace his Egyptian heritage. You know, as being raised by the daughter of Pharaoh, he could have enjoyed all the pleasures of the world, all the riches of Egypt. But rather than that, he chose to suffer hardship with God's people. He considered the reproach of Christ. And that meaning that Moses knew that God had promised to, to the Jews that he was going to send the Messiah. He considered that to be greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And the reason was he was looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise of the sending of Messiah into the world. So we, we look at Moses and we say, well, he chose hardship now that he might enjoy blessing later. And that's, again, what faith does. The world chooses pleasure now. They don't even think about what's coming later. They don't think about the consequences even in this life of, of you know, their choices. But the Christian listens to what God says and looks ahead to what He has promised and acts upon that. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ did exactly the same thing. 
when he chose the path of the cross rather than give in to the devil's temptations in the wilderness. All this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. Jesus says, I'm going to take the path of the cross. I'm going to go through the sufferings. I'm going to honor my father because he loved his father and he loved his people and he knew what was promised. Remember what the author to the Hebrews says, for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Well, last week Brooks warned us that the devil will point to the pleasure, the fun that the world enjoys to get us off the path and to get us to fall into sin. This week he warns us the devil's also going to point to just how difficult the Christian life is. And you know, it is difficult. As over against what the health and wealth preachers say, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. He wants you to have a great time. He wants you to be blessed. You're children of the king. Now, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Christian life is, as a matter of fact, difficult. So what the devil will do is point to that difficulty. Brooks writes, he presents to the soul the crosses, losses, reproaches, sorrows, and sufferings which daily attend those who walk in the ways of holiness. Now, the question we want to ask is, how can we stand? How can we, with Moses, with Jesus, stand against that particular temptation? Well, the answer is quite simply, we do need to look forward, okay? Because suffering is difficult to go through, but all the suffering, all the trials, all the difficulties we have to face, God is working something good through these things. And actually, as we saw in our meditation, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Well, first of all, Brooks reminds us about the good things that God works through our sufferings as Christians. And actually, he gives us a list of several more immediate ones, perhaps, that are more subjective. He makes us more like Christ. Okay, so first of all, these sufferings show us what sin is really like. Now, he, he says this, he says, quote, it was a speech of a German divine, and that could be either a professor of theology or a, a pastor, in his sickness, who said this, in his disease, or excuse me, in this disease, I have learned how great God is and what the evil of sin is. I never knew in my experience who God was, nor what sin meant until now. We're going to see that trials have a way of clarifying certain things for us, things that are very important to see. Now, we know that when gold is heated, we've heard that um, analogy numerous times, uh, Scripture tells us, used in Scripture, that the dross, the impurities rise to the surface. And in the same way, when God melts us through the, the fire of a trial, our dross, our impurities also rise. We begin to see two things how much sin is in our souls. Sometimes, you know, when things are going well, we don't necessarily see it. We think everything is well. We think perhaps we're quite a bit like Jesus. Um, but trials show us otherwise. And trials also show us how evil sin really is. Brooks says this, afflictions are a crystal glass wherein the soul has the clearest sight of the ugly face of sin. And I think we all understand that that's true when we go through difficult times. You know, the worst, it can bring out the worst in us. We get to see that. Well, secondly, along the same lines, trials help us put our sins to death. When we see our sins more clearly, and especially when we see just how evil they really are, it helps us to hate those sins more and become even more determined to put them to death. By the way, there's a lot of these, so they're going to be relatively brief. Brooks writes this, the, the Jews, under all the prophets' thunderings, retained their idols, that is, before the captivity. But after their Babylonish captivity, it is observed there have been no idols found among them. The difficulty cured them, <laughs> finally, of their idolatry. And the point is that sufferings have the tendency to purify us. Third, trials make us holier and more fruitful. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 12, verses 10 and 11, he disciplines us for our good, and trials is part of that discipline, so that we may share his holiness. 
All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So notice holiness, the fruit of righteousness. And really, that's what Jesus has in mind, and perhaps we don't think about it. In John 15, verses 1 and 2, in the opening verses, he says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. I don't know if we ever think about what that pruning really involves, but it is that cleansing, that, that purifying of a trial. And as a matter of fact, once the Lord brings a trial for a true believer, it does end up producing more fruit because of more holiness, because of more love for the Lord, because the Lord has broken some of those sins in our lives. Brooks writes this, saints spring and thrive most within when they are most afflicted without. Afflictions are called by some the mother of virtue. Manasseh's chain was more profitable to him than his crown. That is King Manasseh. He was a wicked king until he was put in chains and released, and then he had a change of heart. Luther could not understand some scripture until he was in affliction. So it gave him more insight in, into the scriptures when he experienced what it is that he was reading in the word of God. So they make us holier and more fruitful. Fourth, trials keep us humble and our hearts sensitive. Jeremiah writes in Lamentations 3, verses 19 and 20, Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. Brooks writes, I've read of uh, Gregory Nancy Anzus uh, in our hymnal. He's the author of hymn number 25, O Light That Knew No Dawn. Anyway, he writes this about him, who when anything fell out prosperously would read over the lamentation of Jeremiah and that kept his heart tender, humbled, and low. This the saints by experience find and therefore they can kiss and embrace the cross as others do the world's crown. Notice again, the point is that Gregory, when things were going well, would still embrace the cross rather than the prosperity. If you embrace the prosperity, trials will come to make you let go of it. <laughs> so again, the idea of humility, holiness, that's what the Lord is after. Fifth, he says they bring us nearer to God. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verses 67 and 71, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. That's the purpose behind God's discipline, is to make us, again, more like the Lord Jesus. So they make us seek the Lord more fervently. They make us pray more fervently. Hosea writes in Hosea 6.1, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us but he will bandage us. So in the midst of the affliction, Hosea says, let's return to the Lord, let's seek him. Brooks writes, afflictions are like the prick at the nightingale's bosom, which awakens her and puts her upon her sweet and delightful singing. Sixth, he says, trials revive us. They strengthen our love. They strengthen our faith. He writes this, most men are like a top which will not go unless you whip it. And the more you whip it, the better it goes. Those who are in adversity, says Luther, do better understand scriptures. But those who are in prosperity, read them as a verse in Ovid. By the way, that, that's a very interesting statement, isn't it? Because um, when you're going through a difficult time and you open the Bible and you read it, I mean, you really see more of God's glory. It, it speaks to you more. The Lord ministers I don't, in, in, a, in a very powerful way. And you understand it. And when you're not going through it, he says it's like reading a verse in Ovid, which is you know, a, a poet. It's just like the writings of men. 
and it doesn't really impact you. Okay, so again, the benefit of it, it strengthens our faith. He says, the more saints are beaten with the hammer of afflictions, the more they are made the trumpets of God's praises, and the more are their graces revived and quickened. Okay, so his first point is the Christian life is full of trials and sufferings, but the Lord works them all for our good. Okay, he makes us more like Jesus through these things. Now, there's a few more points, but they're not nearly as long as this first one. So secondly, he says this, we need to remember that the trials, the difficulties that God brings, the sufferings can only hurt the outward man, can only harm our bodies, but not our souls. Remember how Jesus said when he sent the um, disciples out to, to preach? He says, don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear the one who, after the body has been killed, has the authority to cast the soul into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Okay, it's the soul that is the most important part, not the body. It's not that our bodies aren't important. But trials can only harm the body. They can't, heart, they can't hurt our souls. Peter writes this in 1 Peter 3. Um, he says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, even though your body, um, you might suffer in your body for Christ, you are blessed. Your soul is blessed because, again, God is working all these good things through it. He says, the Christian soldier shall ever be master of the day. He may suffer death, but never conquest. I mean, the worst that anybody can do to us is send our souls to heaven. He also said this, Socrates said of his enemies, they may kill me, but they cannot hurt me. Now, Socrates was wrong about that, but he says, so afflictions may kill us, but they cannot hurt us. They may take away my life, but they cannot take away my God, my Christ, my crown. So again, suffering only hurts the outside, not the inside. Third, he says, trials are short. David writes in Psalm 30, verse 5, which we read for our call to worship, for his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. When Athanasius, he says, his friends, by the way, Athanasius, remember, he was the one who stood his ground on the divinity of Christ. When, uh, I think he had to, I think he suffered exile five times uh, as the political climate and the church climate kept changing between uh, what's called Arianism and Orthodoxy, which is, you know, Trinitarian view versus Unitarianism. Uh, he kept going in and out of his, of his uh, bishopric. But this is what we read, when Athanasius' friends came to bewail him because of his misery and banishment, he said, quote, it is but a little cloud and will quickly be gone. See, Athanasius stood his ground through this whole thing, you know, all, these, all this, again, changing back and forth. He stood his ground on God's truth because he was looking forward to how his Lord would, of course, honor him for this. And as you know, on his tombstone, it's written, Athanasius against the world. He was willing to stand, even when it seemed like the whole world had abandoned the truth. Now, trials are short, but life is also short. Brooks writes this, the short storm will end in an everlasting calm. This short night will end in a glorious day that shall never have end. It is but a very short time between grace and glory, between our title to the crown and our wearing the crown, between our right to the heavenly inheritance and our possession of the heavenly inheritance. What is our life but a shadow, a bubble, a flower, a runner? a span, a dream. Yes, so small a while does the hand of the Lord rest upon us that Luther cannot get diminutives enough to extenuate it, for he calls it a very little cross that we bear. Again, brief time. Um, Edwards, you know, again, that analogy or that statement that he said doesn't really matter who prospers here. What matters is who prospers in eternity. 
Same thing would be true of, of the suffering. The suffering is going to be just a short time here, and I think Edwards had that in view as well. Don't worry about grabbing all you can get here. Instead, use your time here to get all you can in the eternal state. Well, again, it's just a very little cross for a very little time. And as James reminds us, we're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Fourthly, Brooks reminds us we, we need to remember that God sends trials because he loves us. And I hope we get that point by now. He loves us. And these are for our good. And he knows prosperity would ruin us, but he knows that trials will make us more like Christ. Jesus says to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Brooks writes this, Saints, says God, think not that I hate you because I thus chide you. He who escapes discipline may suspect his adoption. God had one son without corruption, but no son without correction. Even Jesus underwent discipline. Remember, discipline isn't always punitive. It's not always corrective for sin. It's something that teaches us. And Jesus learned through his sufferings. Okay? So he says, God had one son without corruption, but no son without correction. A glorious soul may look through the darkest cloud and see God smiling on him. We must look to the anger of his correction, to the sweetness of his countenance. I'm not really sure what he means by the anger of his correction. Perhaps that's how God appears to us. And that is the way that David represented it. Uh, God appears as angry, but yet in his anger, he loves us. So perhaps in a certain sense, as we have experienced that in our own upbringing as far as, uh, well, our raising of our own children, we never want to discipline them in anger, but we do know that there is something we experience that moves us to correct them so that they will do what is good and right because we love them. Okay. So fifthly, he says... We need to look forward to the blessing that God's going to bring through the trial. Again, looking forward. He says this, when Israel was dismissed out of Egypt, it was with gold. So the Jews were dismissed out of Babylon with gifts, jewels, and all necessary utensils. Look more at the latter end of a Christian than the beginning of his affliction. Consider the patience of Job. And what end the Lord made with him? Look not upon Lazarus dying at Dives' door, that is the rich man's door, but lying in Abraham's bosom. Look not to the beginning of Joseph, who was so far from his dream that the sun and moon should reverence him, that for two years he was cast where he could see neither sun, moon, nor stars. But behold him at last made ruler over Egypt, Look not upon David as there was but a step between him and death. I think that's when Saul was chasing him. Nor as he was envied by some and slighted and despised by others. But behold him seated in his royal throne and dying in his bed of honor and his son Solomon and all his glistening nobles about him. You know, look at the end. Don't look at the affliction, but what the affliction will, will bring. Sixthly, he says, remember that God sends trials not, um, excuse me, only to help us, not to destroy us. He says, afflictions are like pinching frosts which will search us. Where we are most unsound, we shall soonest complain. And where most corruptions lie, we shall most shrink. We try metal by knocking. If it sounds well, then we like it. So God tries his, his by knocking. And if under knocks they yield a pleasant sound, God will turn their night into day and their bitter into sweet and their cross into a crown and they shall hear that voice arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you and favors of the Lord are flowing in on you. Well, finally, we need to remember there are far more difficulties, Brooks says, in the path of the wicked are taking than in the path of holiness. And let me just end with this quote. There are snares in all their mercies 
and curses and crossing, crosses attend all their comforts, both at home and abroad. What is a fine suit of clothes with, with a plague in it? And what is a golden cup when there is poison at the bottom? Or what is a silken stocking with a broken leg in it? The curse of God, the wrath of God, the hatred of God, and the fierce indignation of God always attend sinners walking in a way of wickedness. There is no solid joy, nor lasting peace, nor pure comfort, which attends sinners in their sinful ways. There is a sort of vengeance that every moment hangs over their heads by a small thread. And what joy and contentment can attend such souls if the eye of conscience be but so far open as to see the sword? Ah, the horrors and terrors, the tremblings and shakings that attend their souls. So in answering the question, why should we, like Moses, choose suffering for Jesus over the pleasures we might otherwise enjoy in this life? Why should we take the, the hard road? Well, because of this, we know that God will work our sufferings for our good. We know that he will use them to make us more like Jesus. And that really is our heart's desire, to be more like him. That even though they might hurt our bodies, even though they might be injured, our souls will be strengthened and blessed. That these sufferings are so very short in the light of eternity. That they are the signs that God loves us because we know we will be better off in eternity, that we can look forward to the good that God's going to work through that suffering. And then finally, of course, we know that if we took the other road, we would suffer far more in the end. If we hold on to this world, we will also perish with the world. So one thing I want you to notice through this as well is that the Christian life, again, is not an easy life. Okay, it's a hard life. It's a life of suffering. And the way that suffering comes is, again, when we expose ourselves as Christians, when we stand up for the truth, when we shine as lights in the world, that's what draws the, the, the darkness, their ire against us. That is a difficult thing, but those sufferings are worth it. Because, again, the Lord will sanctify them all to our growth in grace, and he will also reward us for those things in the end, it's the only path worth taking. And again, all the saints remind us in Hebrews chapter 11, we need to listen to their testimony. This is that cloud of witnesses surrounding us, telling us that the life of faith is better. So let's again listen to them, look at Jesus, of course, look at these examples, and let's follow their example as they are following the Lord Jesus. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's um, prepare ourselves, uh, well, let's pray that the Lord would apply this to us, and let's also pray that he would prepare us to come to the table.